Okay, in this video I want to begin talking about hemoglobin and myoglobin. And uh, what I have here is an oxygen binding curve with both hemoglobin and myoglobin shown on it. Um, you know, I, I would argue that you could almost understand all the properties of hemoglobin just by going through a little exercise with this oxygen binding curve. So I prepared basically like a series of questions that are going to kind of lead us through this into some ultimate um, understanding and some and some true understanding of what's going on here, some real intuitive understanding. So let's get started here. I said in this first question, I said, how would you describe the shape of the curve for myoglobin and hemoglobin? So let's first look at myoglobin here. And what you'll notice about it is it's got a really steady rise. I mean, this is a really, really steady rise observed until complete saturation at the top here. So the curve levels off at the point where complete saturation occurs. And the shape of this curve, which you might remember from, I don't know, pre-calculus or calculus, is this is called a hyperbolic curve. So myoglobin's curve is known as hyperbolic. So I'll write that in here, hyperbolic. And hemoglobin now we'll look at hemoglobin and we'll see a little bit of a different shape here. Um, the hemoglobin binding curve is known as what's known as sigmoidal or S-shaped curve. You can kind of see that here. And that's going to play a big role in, in actually describing its function here. So this, this curve here in this graph is going to tell us a lot about the way hemoglobin functions. So what I'll say about my what I'll say about hemoglobin is that the curve is sigmoidal or S-shaped. S-shaped. So the curve is sigmoidal or S-shaped. Now, the next question deals with the subunits of hemoglobin. And it says, how many subunits does hemoglobin have and how are they identified? So the thing to know about hemoglobin is that hemoglobin is a tetramer. So it's a tetramer. And what does that mean? That, that just means that it consists of four polypeptide chains. And there's two alpha chains and two beta chains. So that's exactly what I'm going to say here. So it's a tetramer consisting of four polypeptide chains. So, okay. So, now that we have that, it's a tetramer consists of four polypeptide chains. There's two alpha chains, two alpha chains, and two beta chains. Okay. So that means that the overall structure, so if I'm going to say overall structure, is what's known as alpha 2, beta 2. And the thing to know about these is that the two alpha subunits are identical, and the two beta subunits are identical here. So they're exactly the same, and both the alpha and the beta subunits strongly resemble myoglobin. So that's some interesting information to know about um, to know about the overall structure and how these polypeptide chains are arranged. So it's a tetramer. It's got four polypeptide chains, which means it has four subunits, four separate subunits. Now, the next question says, how many oxygen molecules can bind to one molecule of hemoglobin? So I just said up here that hemoglobin is a tetramer, that it has four subunits. And what you need to know about that is that each subunit can bind one oxygen. So if we have a tetramer consisting of four subunits, then you might have guessed it, it can bind four oxygens. So one molecule of hemoglobin can bind four oxygens. And um, likewise, how many oxygens can one subunit of hemoglobin bind? So I say, well, we just said it, really. One subunit can bind one oxygen. So one subunit can bind one oxygen, and one molecule of hemoglobin can bind four oxygens.
Um, the next thing I have down here is this, what is this YO2? And in reference to the graph, YO2 is, is the y-axis here. And it's actually, it, 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 they kind of define it in a strange way with a little bit of a mathematical equation. It's called the fractional saturation. So I'll write that down. So the fractional saturation. Okay, so fractional saturation, so you might be saying, well, what is this said fractional saturation? Well, it's a little bit of an equation. It says YO2 is equal to the sites occupied. So it's equal to the sites occupied over the total available sites. So what does that mean? It, it basically just means it can be thought of as the saturation of hemoglobin or myoglobin with oxygen. I mean, even though it's sites occupied over total available sites, it really doesn't make a difference. It can just simply be thought of as the saturation of hemoglobin or myoglobin with oxygen. So YO2, the saturation of hemoglobin or myoglobin with oxygen. So now that we have that taken care of, I want to talk about the graph here because the graph is extremely important. And what I want to say, or what I want to start about with saying here is that the curve tells us a lot about hemoglobin and myoglobin's function. So what you should notice about the shape of myoglobin here and the sigmoidal shape and what that indicates is that the shape indicates that it binds oxygen really tightly, even at low pressure. So you can imagine, this is, this is not labeled here, but let's just put in some arbitrary numbers, we'll call this. 100 and these are usually in TORA or T-O-R-R -R for short as the unit that I'm talking about here and we can also put in another one over here I'll say maybe this is 40 over here and maybe I'll even go one further and say 20 because both of those are going to be important so notice here myoglobin's curve we said it's hyperbolic and um, it tells us basically that this is binding oxygen really tightly. Look, I mean, there's not a, here's the pressure, and the pressure is not really increasing. This thing is binding oxygen really, really tightly. They say the P50 is 2.8 tor, tor on this graph, but that's not true. It's actually 1 tor. So it's actually 1 tor. And the difference, and, you, and then we can notice the difference here in hemoglobin. What's that telling us? Well, that's telling us that it's actually not binding oxygen as tightly at lower pressure. So at 20 tor, 40 tor, this is still not really binding too tightly. We see that the P50, which is the 50% saturation point, so at P50 here, at 26 tor, exactly 50% of the hemoglobin molecules will be saturated with oxygen. So 50% saturation at 26 tor. So that, that takes a while to get to. I mean, that's somewhere down in here. I mean, I might be a little off with my numbers there, but somewhere down in there, this 26 tor is um, occurring. And the S-shaped curve here indicates the binding indicates the binding of the first oxygen facilitates the binding of the second oxygen, and the second oxygen facilitates the binding of the third oxygen, and the third oxygen facilitates the binding of the fourth oxygen. So what does that mean overall for us? It basically means that once the first oxygen binds, which actually takes quite a bit of pressure here, as you can see, the, it doesn't really bind very easily, and that's what I'm basically saying. It doesn't bind easily. But once it binds, it actually induces a conformational change in the subunit. So because this is a tetramer, and all four subunits are really, really close together and interacting with each other, once one changes its conformation, it's going to induce a conformational change in the next one. And that conformational change that's induced in the, in the next subunit is what allows the second oxygen to bind a little bit easier. And the same thing happens then from the second, which has, induce, which has a conformational change that induces a conformational change in the third subunit, again, making it even easier for the third oxygen to bind. And by the fourth oxygen, it's very easy for it to bind. I mean, by the time you get to the fourth oxygen, it's very, very simple to bind. So what this is known as is cooperative binding. So I'm going to write that down. See.
cooperative binding. So all that means is that each subsequent oxygen is easier to put on than the previous one. So I'll write that down too. Each subsequent oxygen is easier to put on than the previous one. So each subsequent oxygen is easier to put on than the previous one. And that's and that's all this curve is basically telling us. It, it's just telling us that it's going to be difficult to put the first one on, but as we go up here, as we increase the pressure, it's going to get easier and easier to put oxygens on until it's fully saturated. So, and as I said before, the subunits are in very close proximity with each other. So once that first oxygen binds, it induces a conformational change in the first subunit, which also, which then induces a conformational change in the second subunit, and and so on. And this is going to become even more important as we start um, looking at then the overall function of hemoglobin and myoglobin. Um, I'm going to cover that in the next video because I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to stop here and we'll come back.